Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Borston, and I am CNBC's senior media and entertainment reporter. I'm joined now by my friend and colleague, John Ford. We are partners hey. in crime on Tech Check. John, thanks for yeah. being here today. Great to be with you. I think I just bumped the mic. Let me move the mic <laughs> out of the way. So, John, today is CNBC's Disruptor 50 Day. I've yeah. been up since the wee hours of the morning. For those of you <laughs> who don't know, I am very proud to have launched the Disruptor 50 list on CNBC nine years ago. Yeah. Every year it gets bigger, better, and more exciting. We had 1,500 nominees for this year's list. But, Julia, honestly, yeah. Slots. You're always up at the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> That's the, the, the problem with being uh, being up here on the West Coast. But so, John, I want to bring in our guests and I want to talk about all of the companies on this list, but particularly the number one company on this year's list, which is Robinhood. But so let's bring in our three guests. These three folks are all members of CNBC's Disruptor 50 Advisory Council. So they help us with the, um, putting together the list and figuring out how to weight the different pieces of the list. I see two of them, uh, Ari Wallach, Long Paths Founder and Executive Director, and Banu Auskazak Pan, Brown University School of Engineering. And I want to thank you both for being here. We may be joined by a third shortly. Um, but thank you both for being here. You both have unique insight into what we're going to be talking about today. But we got to start off with Robinhood. And actually, John, I'm going to go to you first. What do you think about Robinhood being number one on the list? I I'm torn on this, right? Because if, if we're doing the time person of the year model of, we're not saying that they're necessarily beloved, but they're important. It makes a lot of sense. But I can't help but notice number two is Stripe. And Stripe is appearing for the sixth time. They're bigger than Robin Hood. You know, they, they, they're really entrenched in the digital ecosystem. But I got to say, in fintech, who's made more waves than Robin Hood this year, both in terms of disrupting how stocks are normally traded, and then disrupting the flow of some of those retail investors who they've been empowering. So uh, all kinds of disruption there. Yeah, and certainly what's been interesting is we've seen um, guys with a company like Robinhood that the incumbent banks have really taken note. We just saw Fidelity launch new trading tools for kids, um, wanting to make it easier for kids to learn how to trade. Ari, I'm curious what you think about the fintech space and what the long tail effects will be of a tool like Robinhood, which has made so many waves in the past year. It's a great question. And I'm, I'm going to join uh, the John train here in that I'm torn because, yes, it is very disruptive what Robinhood is doing. But at the same time, when you look at their underlying business model, what they're really doing is they are making their revenue off of how often how much you trade. And so for someone like me who runs an organization that is thinking about the long term, the next several decades, when we see revenue models that are based on, in many ways, kind of nanosecond trading, what that does is it can instill in folks the idea that you're just there to be part of the casino and you're not there actually investing in the long term of, of companies that you want to see grow over time. So look, if I could, you didn't ask me this question, but if I could, if I could tweak Robinhood, I'd make it somehow so that the longer you hold something, somehow the more that you make. And I know that I'm living in fantasy land, but that's what I would love because look, I used Robinhood and it was great. And I felt like I was in Las Vegas, but that's not necessarily the way to build an economy that's, that works for all over the next several decades. Yeah, absolutely. Brendan, what do you think here? Because I know you are really focused on in inclusive, the inclusive VC community. How can you make the, the sort of VC tech ecosystem understand the value and in inclusivity? And one thing that Robinhood has stressed is that it's actually a democratizing force, that it's reaching more diverse investors. It's taking these investing tools that were previously limited to a very small group of people and making them more widely accessible. Do you buy that argument? To an extent, I think they are correct in that the investor base that they're targeting and those that are participating in investing are dramatically different than many of the people that are um, going to be investing in Wall Street. At the same time, when we say it's sort of a casino and you are only making money if it's um, the short term bets and based on transactions, if we look at venture capital, it's not that different to some extent when we look at the ways in which investments have taken shape, particularly in terms of some of the immense risks that have been undertaken by venture capitalists to, um, you know, the fault of the companies falling apart and many people sort of losing jobs. 
Yeah, and I think I just wanna pause for a moment here and just have each of you, Banu and Ari, explain the lens through which you look at entrepreneurship and startups. And Banu, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work looking at diversity and inclusion in the, in the VC and tech landscape? Yeah, happy to do so, Julia. So I am the founder and director of the Venture Capital Inclusion Lab, which is at Brown University's Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And really, I'm trying to understand the mechanisms and drivers of why we see underrepresentation of minorities and women, both on venture back founders, but also in the investment community, and really trying to understand what are the drivers and mechanisms and ways that we can mitigate them. So my lens for looking at this is really diversity, equity, and inclusion. And where are we seeing some of those um, companies uh, make efforts towards those ends? And where are we seeing companies um, really not invest in these activities at all? Fascinating. This is something we, John and I talk about a lot, both on Tech Check and, and offline. Ari, tell us about your long, your long-term focus. So, so Long Range Labs was started several years ago, and our emphasis, our lens is the long term, right? So we are very much concerned about how do we ensure human flourishing on a sustainable planet over the next several decades, and to be honest, over the next several centuries. And I know that puts us in kind of a a small group of folks, especially when people are kind of looking at the ticker along the bottom. But the fact of the matter is, if we're going to meet the challenges of tomorrow, we have to start doing that today. So when I look at the disruptor list, the lens that I'm looking at is, who's actually thinking about how do you feed 9 to 10 billion people on planet Earth in the year 2050? What does topsoil look like? How are you meeting the needs of hundreds of millions of folks that are becoming, not just being born, but coming online in sub-Saharan Africa? So our lens within the startup community is always going to be who's kind of meeting those challenges and rising up. So not necessarily trying to flip something quickly, but in many ways, they're going to be with us for decades, right? If, if we look at the companies that are the most successful over time, those are the ones who have been thinking about doing things over the long haul. We're talking not just five, 10 years, but 50 or 100 years. So our lens is always going to be how are they positively impacting the long-term viability of of, to be honest, homo sapiens on this one planet that we have. Well, it's certainly a perspective that I think most companies do not take with a lot more focus on the near term, don't you think, John? Well, uh, companies, just like investors, like to say they focus on the long term. I think there are so many forces that pull them into short-term thinking. And so to me, one of the exciting things about the disruptor list is that uh, very often, you know, we're talking about this disruptive moment that these companies have, have created in this one year period of time, but they've taken a long view and invested in creating the momentum that got them here for a long time. And I think the question is, how successful will they continue to be? Because big companies can have some disruptive forces of their own that they push back when they're well prepared. But, you know, I'm just thinking back to, we were just talking about Robin Hood and how you know some of the incentives might not be aligned in the right way, in the perfect way at least, mm -hmm. perhaps for, for the way some of us think about it. And it just got me thinking about social media because there's a similar criticism around advertising as a business model across so much of social media, the idea that, well, who's really paying here? Who's the product versus who's the customer? Some of that coming into question in FinTech too. And I would say not just necessarily with Robinhood, but you know, uh, we'll in the future probably be talking more about Coinbase now on the disruptor list because they're uh, public now, but they were on the list in 2018. And kind of with their model, it's similar. Like when there's volatility, when there's trading, they make money, not necessarily when people who are on the platform make money off of crypto. But you know, I, I think both investors and consumers have to think about what the models are for these things because sometimes the consumer gets disrupted. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the social media question. I want to talk about Clubhouse and Discord in a minute, but I want to jump back to something that Ari just brought up, this idea of really thinking about the environmental implications. And I know this is something you're very focused on, Ari. What's interesting about this year's list is about two thirds of the companies said they had an environmental or social mission that was part of the company's business model. So not that they were gonna make a donation or for every one of something sold, they were gonna give one, give one out for free, but that they were in, in sort of intimately addressing that issue. So for instance, we have a number of environmentally focused companies that are trying to get rid of um, animal uh, meat production. So Eat Just is one of them. We have other companies like Footprint, which is getting rid of plastic. We have Appeal, 
which is trying to help food uh, stay uh, last longer. They're creating these natural coatings for food, so not as much food will go to waste. And then, of course, we have Indigo, which was number one on our list a couple of years ago, which is trying to improve the agriculture um, economy. So I'm curious what you think. Is it <laughs> Um, well, Impossible is, is one of those. Impossible says they are, are looking to help the environment by sort of converting people off of eating meat to eating plant-based foods. So that definitely falls into that category. So I'm curious, Wipanu and, and Ari, what you think of those companies. Do you think they could have a really long tail impact on the environment while also being, being fast growing profitable businesses? Yeah, uh, from my perspective, I think of sustainability with a wider lens than literally the physical earth, because when you look at the communities that are gonna be impacted by many of the climate change features, they tend to be, uh, for example, in the city of Boston, communities that are already not uh, well off, that are in uh, communities that are uh, suffering uh, inequities in healthcare and access to education. So in many ways, I see that as sort of an important inflection point for addressing existing inequalities in the human domain as we expand to the environmental. So for me, I think it's really important that we continue to uh, address the environmental issues, but at the same time, not lose sight of the things that are already inequitable at the you know moment that we're experiencing the Anthropocene right now. So uh, echoing everything that was just said and also adding that it used to be that you, you had your product on one side and you had your corporate foundation on the other side. And sometimes your foundation was actually just cleaning up what your product did on the other side. And now what we're seeing is those things are actually intertwined. Why? Because the market demands it, but even more so, we know the next wave of workers demand it, right? When we're looking at Gen Y and Z and millennials, where do they want to work? They want to be proud of where they want to work. They, when they tell their friends where they work and when they go to bed at night and they don't see this distinction of, well, I make a bunch of money in my nine to five and then I write a check when I get home to a nonprofit. They want that to be all part of the same thing, right? So when I look at some of these things like Impossible or Indigo, these are companies that are making a difference in their actual underlying product or platform. And it's something that folks can be proud of and not something that they kind of like cough, cough, you know, don't, because I look, I used to live in Silicon, around Silicon Valley and people would all the time tell you where they worked. Now you ask some folks where they work in Silicon Valley and they'll just say, oh, at a tech company. And you, you keep digging and you find out it's one of the big old school disruptors and they're not proud of it. So if you want to retain this workforce for the 21st century, your product, your platform and your mission are all going to have to co-evolve and be part of the same package. I want to have one, introduce one more thought before we bring in some CEO guests. And that is on a topic that John alluded to, which is sort of who is the product in social media and this idea that, you know, Facebook has been loudly criticized, so is Google, for being about monetizing people's data and data about their movements. We've seen three companies um, on, this com on this year's list arise really and explode in the past year because they're about the social audio space and also the new creator economy. And that's Discord, which used to be just for video gamers now about a lot more than that. It's Clubhouse, which didn't even exist a year ago, basically, um, which is about communities getting together and, and talking on this, this uh, private platform. And then the third one I wanna point out is Patreon, which is uh, enabling creators to monetize their user base and their fan base. And John, I'm curious if, if you think this will represent the beginning of what could be a real sea shift away from reliance on these social platforms for people to, to monetize their followers and fan base. Yes, I do. I, I think, I, that's not to say I think any one of these companies is gonna be the next fill in the blank, Google, Facebook, et cetera. But I think the, the model of um, charging people for a high quality service, maybe uh, creating a, an ecosystem that's about charging uh, is definitely spreading. Look at Substack, which is also um, backed by Andreessen Horowitz, which backs Clubhouse, and they seem to have that kind of media interest. There's so many uh, different companies out there. I mean, right now we're on StreamYard, right, uh, using this service, and it got purchased by Hopin for, I think, what, $150 million? Because that same model. I mean, you, you pay for StreamYard, maybe not, I mean, definitely not as much as you would have paid for encoders just a couple of years ago to do the same sort of multi-platform streaming thing. But hey, they're not trying to throw ads of their own in here while we're talking. They're saying, no, we're going to give you uh, a service. You pay for it. 
And we think we can scale that. So I definitely think that's the effort here that Clubhouse, uh, that Clubhouse has the potential to sort of disrupt podcasts. Uh, Patreon has some potential in there to, to do some things, even to Spotify, uh, perhaps. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential in kind of creating these tools. What's old is new again. I mean, Adobe, in a way, did this in the, the PC and server era of things. And I think now in the social and sort of ubiquitous engagement era of the web and apps, kind of a new generation of businesses is surging forward saying, we can do this well enough that you're going to want to pay. Ari, what do you think? Do you think the pandemic will prove a turning point in the way people communicate permanently? Well, I think it, it, there's two turning points. One, it's how people communicate. And two, it's what's important to them, right? So uh, what, what happened with us personally as a family and a lot of the folks that I knew is things that we did that we just did because we felt we had to do, we've kind of left by the wayside. And now we're focused on the things that are most important. And I think a lot of folks are going to be kind of taking that into the future with them. And at the same time, when I look at Clubhouse or Discord, what they're really about, and this goes back to John, you know, what's old is new again. Clubhouse is really just the campfire that we've been around for about 50,000 years, right? It's about telling stories and being one with another, with each other, and not having these kind of classic gatekeepers tell us what to hear and think. I, I've been on Clubhouse for the past couple of days, listening to this kind of running dialogue that's being moderated by folks around the world, the Palestinians, Israelis, both in their, you know, or last week, both in their shelters, both in their basements. That you never got that from Walter Cronkite. And for better or for worse, this disaggregation and the ability for us to kind of reconnect as humans with the pandemic kind of pushed back out of us again, those who kind of were launched and kind of took advantage of that, and I mean that in the best way possible, are going to be with us for the long haul. Fascinating. And Banu, I want to I want to give you, you an opportunity to speak here, particularly at how the past year has changed people in terms of the attention to diversity. It was a year ago that the world erupted in horror um, and Black Lives Matter really became a force in our nation. How do you think that's gonna end up changing the way people think about invest investing in business and diversity? Yeah, and it's to the day today, it's very meaningful that we're having this conversation. I think what happened in the aftermath is we saw many, many organizations, particularly in venture capital, put out statements of racial equity, of awareness, and wanting to have the intention at least to do something. And over the course of the year, we've seen some of them take meaningful action. But I think beyond that, we've seen a real change in how people think about the values that are within their lives and how they want to live them in a manner that's aligned. So whether that's um, creating community and being part of something bigger, or it's my students at Brown University saying, I really value where I work and it has to be aligned with how I sort of want to be in the world. I'm really seeing a sea of change around how the discourses around uh, equity and justice are trickling down into people's everyday actions and thoughts around who they are, where they should work and how they should spend their money and resources. John, you wanna weigh in here? Uh, no, I, I think that that makes sense. Um, you know, the cynical part of me says it can be trendy. So, um, you know. Completely um, agree. Profits are not trendy. <laughs> People like those all the time. Um, but, but issues can be trendy. At the same time, though, when they are deeply held values of companies and investors, as long as those companies and investors are successful, they can uh, keep those issues at the fore. Well, I hope those issues do stay at the fore. We are going to thank Ari and Banu here. Please feel free to stick around. We're going to bring in some CEOs. If you want to stick around, we could check in again at the end. But thank you both so much for talking to us today. So, John, now we're going to bring in Howie Liu. He is CEO of Airtable, which is a fascinating company. Howie, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And congrats on being on this year's Disruptor 50 list. Um, the way I explain Airtable to people is this idea that it gives employees superpowers with these low code and no code tools. So even though I may not be an engineer, I may know nothing about coding, I could all of a sudden be capable of coding a website or an app. Is that fair? How would you describe the company? That's right. And I think we have a particular focus on apps that, that empower employees to, to get their work done. So you know, I think um, the, the premise of Airtable is really that all these, these people in every company have much more intimate understanding of how they should be doing their jobs, what software tools they should be using. And yet they don't typically have control to actually you know, mold that software to work the way they want. And so um, you know, Airtable really is a platform that enables anybody to go and create the software they need to do their work uh, within their companies. And so 
Sorry, go ahead, John. Oh no, I mean, I, I was I wasn't planning to jump in right there. Oh, but I can, I can. Yeah. So I mean, there, there's a lot of talk about low code and no code apps right now and that kind of ecosystem. But I wonder how far you can push it. Uh, I remember a few years back, maybe three years ago, talking to Tony Shu at DoorDash about how he was arming employees with you know a SQL training so that they would be able to interrogate the data and come up with ideas themselves. That's a very powerful concept. But then at the same time, if people aren't trained even in the thought process to interrogate data or to uh, to code apps, they might not be as successful. So how much, how far can you push this without having to create a whole new kind of skill set or job category, even around low code and no code? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, there there are programmatic concepts, uh, you know, at, at different levels of, of complexity, and um, I think there there are some you know data modeling concepts that are fairly easy to to teach most people, right? Um, and in fact. You know, our goal with Airtable is to make it so that you don't have to go and take a course on how to model your, your business objects. You know, if you're at a retail fashion company, you have products and you have launch dates and so on. And we want you to just be able to come in and kind of build out your data model in our platform without having to learn, you know, um, anything super technical. And then from there, there's all these other layers of extensibility. You can build logic and say, you know, if I create a, a new product, um, you know, in, in, a, in the tool, then I want it to go and trigger these other things. And so I think, um, you know, we, we believe in this idea of kind of progressive enhancement and, you know, that there are a lot of different levels of, of complexity in terms of those programmatic concepts and that, you know, we, we can kind of make it an easier stepping function for, for people to, to dive into those. I guess with all of that in mind, Howie, I'm curious how big you see the addressable market as being for these tools. Are these the kind of things that someday I might use if I wanted to build a website with my kid? Or is this really much more of an enterprise thing? Yeah, there, there's kind of two different halves of the low code uh, space right now. I think there's, um, as you alluded to, you know, there's the kind of externally facing, let me build a website. You know, I think there's great companies like, for instance, Webflow or Squarespace, Wix, et cetera, that have made it really easy to build a website and even build some interactivity into that website, right? So not just a static page that shows content, but that allows you to interact. Um, on the flip side, I think companies like Airtable, Zapier, uh, these are really companies that are focused on, on powering the internal business processes that make companies run. And so um, at least in our view, um, you know, both are really, really large categories. We've seen you know, almost every type of industry, company uh, size, you know, role type adopt our product. And so you know, uh, in, in your particular case, I think you could come in and actually kind of build a use case in Airtable yourself today, um, whether it's you know, managing your, your guests and, and the topics that you're gonna be talking about or um, something else related to the production workflow. But so who do you see as your main competition going forward? So I think it's interesting, you know, when we started the company, um, you know, roughly nine years ago, we really, you know, saw the the world was kind of oriented around either project management tools, very focused on kind of task management, um, or you have these like kind of very powerful low code app platforms like ServiceNow, Salesforce, AppCloud, um, that were, you know, mostly top down adopted, mostly IT deployed. And, you know, I think increasingly, we've seen more validation of the kind of in between, which we believe is really, really large. You know, if you need more than just task management, um, but you you want the the kind of business end user themselves to be able to go and build the applications they need. Um, there's really not, um, you know, there weren't a lot of products out there. I think you you are starting to see, um, you know, some interesting companies. For instance, uh, you know, Monday is is starting to to move towards this uh, this category. But but ultimately, I think what what we're um, what we're focused on really is is to be the most powerful platform that anyone can go in and use and build really sophisticated applications um, for for uh, for their businesses. Okay, now a different kind of disruption question. Miami and a bunch of other cities are trying to disrupt San Francisco. So why are you still there? Yeah, you know, I think um, San Francisco has has a lot of uh, benefits still. Um, you know, one one of which is it's just got such an amazing community. Um, you know, of talent of, of people who I think dream big and, and uh, you know, um, there, there's such a density of, of tech talent that uh, not only is it is it great for us from a, a recruiting standpoint, but I also think just being plugged in to all of the, uh, the knowledge sharing, the learnings, et cetera, here uh, has remained valuable for us. But we do have offices outside of SF, uh, New York, Austin, um, and, and may plan on uh, building building even more over time. And I got to ask, what's your outlook towards returning to in-person work? Will your future be hybrid? What will it be? I think um, it's very likely that we will uh, be increasingly hybrid over time. Um, you know, I think we're still 
uh, playing it a little bit by ear. Um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, there's so many unknown unknowns, I think, about the world post-COVID. Um, we don't even know uh, necessarily when it will be fully safe to bring everyone um, you know, back into the office on the days that we do want um, that in-person collaboration experience. But, um, but I think we've all experienced the, the benefits of cutting out the commute, of, of being able to, um, you know, have focus time. And so we'll definitely end up somewhere, uh, you know, in the, in the hybrid spectrum. Well, Howie, thanks so much for joining us. Please feel free to stick around. We're going to talk to two other CEOs. And if you want to want to stick around, we can bring you all together at the end. But thanks for coming to talk to us about Airtable today. Thanks so, John, us. thank you. So, John, before we bring in Block Power, what do you think? Do you think there's going to be more of a mass exodus from the Silicon Valley, San Francisco area? Uh, I think there are companies dipping their toe in expanding outside of the Bay Area. But even the Bay Area is pretty darn diverse. Like, I think... San Francisco sort of disrupted San Jose. Like San Jose used to put itself forth, hey, we're the capital of Silicon Valley, whatnot. And then they just move up to San Francisco. I think it, you might see some companies moving further down to the South Bay, which is maybe, well, definitely less left-leaning, has some different policies than San Francisco does. If you go to the East Bay and to the North and to that sort of like Walnut Creek area, that's practically a red state, you know, for, by California standards. And there's some different real estate possibilities there. So, I mean, I think between all those different dynamics, even in the Bay Area, you'll see some people shuffling around. But I think very often these ideas of mass exodus or like mass shifts, they're both underestimated and overestimated. I don't think people are moving out of the Bay Area or going to permanently nearly as much as a lot of people say. Uh, but I think there is a significant movement for different industries. Well, look, I, every year we have fewer companies from the Silicon Valley area on the CNBC Disruptor 50 list and fewer from California. Um, but right now we're going to bring in a CEO from a company that's based in Brooklyn, Block Power. And we're joined now by Donnell Baird. Thank you so much for talking to us. So excited to be here with you. Thank you for having us. You're coming from Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn, Brooklyn, opposite so, of Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, so we'll talk more about the Always advantages, funky fresh. <laughs> the advantages of not being in Silicon Valley in a bit. But first, why don't you explain Block Power? This is a perfect example of a company that has environmental sustainability really built into its business model. Yeah. Uh, so at Block Power, we're 100% focused on electrifying buildings, just like Tesla is taking the fossil fuels out of the automobile. We can now take fossil fuels out of buildings. And so we're moving buildings off of fossil fuels to 100% electricity. We analyze, finance, and install um, electrification equipment uh, in buildings across the country. And so the business model is you get paid by the, by the buildings for doing the conversion. Do you benefit from, from tax cuts? I mean, I live here in California and I installed solar power because it ended up costing less because there were tax incentives to do so. There's tax incentives from the government. There's rebates from the, your local utility company. Uh, the regulators ask them to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, actually, in terms of smart grid and making sure that different areas of the electricity or gas grid are up to date, um, utilities provide incentives to building owners to, to you know, add solar panels or move to all electric. And so we help building owners access those rebates and tax credits. And then in some instances, we get paid uh, by the utility or by the local government to help reach out to building owners and bring those buildings into compliance with local regulations. As you know, in the Bay Area, you know, there's about 30 local cities that have said, you know, no more fossil fuels in buildings in Berkeley or San Francisco. And so as we bring those buildings into compliance, sometimes the city may pay us uh, for helping to support their policy. And so you're really focused on urban areas. How big do you think the market is and what's your outlook for growth over the next couple of years? Uh, there's trillions of dollars um, to be invested in real estate assets in urban communities and low income communities, even if they're in rural areas. Uh, we focus on small and medium enterprise uh, buildings. So not skyscrapers, but you know, your medium sized buildings, schools, uh, apartment complexes, uh, even churches and synagogues and mosques, uh, community centers. Um, there's 5 million of these buildings. They, they, they spend over $100 billion per year 
on fossil fuels that they waste and don't even consume. So massive, massive market. And the question is, how do you build a digital platform that allows you to, to digitize and finance the conversions of these real estate assets to green energy and green infrastructure across the whole country? So massive town. So, so Donnell, where does something like lead certification fit into this and into your strategy? I mean, I remember, you know, years ago, 20 years ago now, you know, Adobe was building those towers in San Jose. They were very proud of how, you know, environmentally conscious they were about the like waterless urinals and, you know, all the various things, you know, how they would run the water and, and not. Um, when you're doing a project like you are, it seems like uh, some of the elements of it might not get picked up by traditional measures and means. And uh, sometimes for the companies, those traditional measures and means are important to meeting uh, targets either for regulation or that they've set uh, for themselves defined by older standards already. Yeah, so there, there are questions around lead certification. As you all may know, New York City, the government has passed the most aggressive green building mandate in the country, if not the world. And so buildings, even lead certified buildings, face massive million dollar per year fines if they don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30, 40, 50% um, over the next five to 10 years. And so even you know, buildings that are LEED certified are gonna need to make massive reductions in order to get to significant uh, emissions reductions and offsets uh, in order to comply with the laws. That's the macro trend across the country. There's 200 uh, cities across America that have said they wanna be 100% renewable energy. We have a, a city that we're working with, we, we can't say who it is yet, but they want to be 100% renewable energy in the next five years. Um, so we're super excited about this macro trend. And yeah, some buildings that are LEED certified are going to have to do a little bit of extra work in order to comply with the new sets of standards. Amazing. Now, here's a, here's a question. You talk about the macro trends working your favor. Presumably, it's more cost efficient for companies or for buildings once they make the transition. But how do you position what might be a little bit of an upfront investment and what the, the sort of cost benefit analysis is for the people you're trying to convert to your, your system? Well, we, we, we believe that we have to, the Silicon Valley mantra of better, faster, cheaper, we believe that. We've learned that from our investors at Andreessen Horowitz and Kapor Capital, we, we believe that. So. Clean energy can't just be like the moral or ethical thing to do. It's got to be awesome, which Tesla is demonstrating, but it's also got to be better and faster and cheaper. And so once we convert a building to 100% electricity, yeah, there has to be significant savings operationally um, you know, for that building in order for the investments to pencil out. I mean, Goldman didn't lend us our capital uh, just because they're trying to do the right thing. They need to make a return on their investment. Um, and so, you know, we believe that distributed clean energy investments allow them uh, to do that. Um, and so we believe that increasing property values, lowering operational costs by moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure is the way to go. Part of that to your question is, how do we train and hire the next generation of smart, green, tech-enabled construction workers who are using augmented reality to go building to building and, and upgrade and retrofit these buildings in a sustainable fashion. So, you know, part of this is how do you get millennials? It's great to go on YouTube and be an influencer, but we, we need some folks to, to, to figure out how to use augmented reality and become that tech-enabled workforce of the future. Okay. I just, well, can well, I just ask a quick follow-up here just about the logistics, about like what is the biggest barrier to growth? If it's financially advantageous to switch out of fossil fuels into green power, if if there are tax incentives, is the biggest barrier to growth lack of awareness? Is it lack of the construction workers? What's keeping you from growing even faster? It's the it's the lack of highly skilled uh, construction workers and project managers across America. If you look at the big construction companies, everyone's suffering from a labor shortage of high. You know, if you if, if you're a plumber and you're 60 and you're retiring, your kid, you know, you sent them to college because you're making a great salary as a plumber. They don't want to take over that plumbing business and run it, right? They want to do something else. They want to go work at Facebook as a product manager. And so when you look at the data across the country, uh, highly skilled construction services is a need that our country has. So we do have to inspire and train a new generation of, of tech-enabled construction workforce that's going to increase the labor supply and decrease pricing so that we can make it better, faster, cheaper for buildings to go green. And that's, that's the big constraint. We obviously need policy 
but the Biden Harris uh, administration is leading that. And even in red states, you're seeing the cost of clean energy come down, even in the heart of Texas, you know, the growth of wind energy and solar is huge. And so it really is that workforce. Yeah. Well, I mean, talk about pipelines. You're a black CEO on the Disruptor 50. So we got to talk about that. You know, I, I see you dropping Goldman and Andreessen Horowitz and whatnot. Uh, so I, I, you get extra Disruptor credit for that. You like disrupted the Disruptor list uh, this year. Not to say it's never happened before, but it's still significant. So um, talk to me about the environment uh, for, you know, when it comes to raising capital, when it comes to communicating vision and the, and the receptivity uh, to that, when you don't look like the, the pattern matched entrepreneur that some of these VCs out there are looking for? You know, you, you would have thought that my press people had prepared me for this question. It's a really important one, John. I, uh, I'm going to try not to say anything that gets myself in trouble. You know, we're going to have to raise a significant amounts of capital from VC, from private equity, from Wall Street in order to continue to grow our business. So I don't want to uh, say anything that's going to uh, 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 poop where I, where I need to drink my water. But um, yeah, I mean, women, minority CEOs and founders face significant headwinds. We talked to 200 investment firms before we got our first yes. It was no, no, no uh, for months and months on end um, until we went into Andreessen and Hearts and Kapor Capital and they agreed to invest the first $500,000 in our company. Now, what we found is prior to meeting me, they had in their personal life, in their business life, in their philanthropic life, they had demonstrated an affinity to understanding uh, nuances of the Black American community, either in their personal life. Again, they're donating money charitably. They have long-term business relationships with people from the Black community. And so what the only advice I can offer is don't believe the hype about Silicon Valley becoming more diverse. But what you do want to do is to screen for investors who have some prior knowledge of the community that you come from and uh, have demonstrated an affinity to understanding the nuances of what it means to be a woman in America or a Latinx founder or a black person. And so for us, we've been really fortunate that, you know, the Am AmFam, uh, uh, you know, a $10 billion insurance conglomerate in Madison, Wisconsin, they made a commitment to racial equity. And so when we pitched them, they were, they were leaning forward when we're talking about clean energy and racial equity instead of leaning backwards and saying, ah, I just feel like you're going to go out there and lose my money because I don't quite trust you. So, you know, early stage investing is more art than science, despite what everybody says. And so part of it is really trying to be clear about who's going to be leaning forward when you're, you're talking to them and sharing your vision and uh, operating in that fashion. That's what we've done. And um, that's, that's what's been helpful for us. You know, here we are on the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And in the past year, you know, we've talked a lot on our air with companies, with investors about their commitment to be more aware of diversity. And something that John and I have talked a lot about is whether or not this is lip service or whether these commitments made, these statements set out are actually going to result in systemic change. And, um, you know, I haven't talked about it with John today, but, you know, this has been a conversation we've had for a long time now. And I'm curious if you think that, you know, a year later, there is going to be a meaningful shift in the culture towards understanding something that I talk about a lot, which is the financial opportunity in investing in diversity. You know, obviously, you know, VCs have, you know, re rely a lot on pattern matching, particularly in those early rounds of investment. And um, I don't know if you have any indication of sort of the nature of questions or anything shifting as you go out, um, as you go out to do your next round of funding, where there's more of a focus on the results than uh, than there maybe was in your earlier rounds. Nah, unfortunately, no. I think you know, uh, God, God bless all the folks in Silicon Valley. I love them. Um, the people like Kapor Capital and Andreessen and Horowitz who are investing in women and Latino and Black founders before George Floyd. Those are the same people who are investing after the firms that made public commitments. I believe that their intentions are real, but I believe that the pattern matching that you spoke of where they're basically deep in their heart of hearts, they're just looking for a 19 year old Harvard or Stanford dropout who's been doing computer programming since they were age 10. That's still the pattern and the archetype that they're looking for. And so it's really hard to move people off of that. 
what has been really interesting for me, and if you look at the way that we raise capital, corporates like giant, strategic, supposedly slow, you know, non-innovative corporations and their strategic investment arms. I mean, look at our company. We have AmFam out of Wisconsin. We got Goldman. We got Salesforce. And we have impact investors in the form of Kport Capital. Um, these are the folks who came together to do our round in the middle of a pandemic, right? Um, you know, it wasn't um, it wasn't traditional institutional VCs other than Mitch and Frida K. Port Klein. Um, it was um, mostly these large corporates who 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 wanted to invest in a platform that's that's making progress on environmental and social justice. So I do think that there's going to be a lot of capital and infrastructure and support that gets built out because corporate America at Goldman and Salesforce, they have decided to lead the charge and there's a new generation of leadership that's in those companies and they're going to move the ball forward. I actually think Silicon Valley is going to, is going to lag uh, that and with respect to diversity and investing in women and minority founders. Fascinating. And the role, the role of corporate VCs is amazing. John, go ahead. Yeah. I want to get a question in here. Uh, from our from our live social audience, Randy R on LinkedIn, uh, keying off Donnell, something you were talking about before. I think when you were talking about the shortage in labor out there, he asks, please elaborate on augmented reality trained trades. What specific trade? What specific task in retrofitting? Yeah, so part of the holy grail is um, how do you digitize the construction process and build a three dimensional model and really a four dimensional model, including time and the way that a construction project in a building changes over time so that you can go backwards and forwards through that project digitally and understand uh, what's happening in that project. Is it operating according to plan? Are there changes that need to be made? How do you anticipate uh, the, the intersection or clash between the plumbers and the electricians on the construction project? Well, if you can hammer out a lot of that stuff digitally in AR, uh, then you can resolve a lot of problems before you even get to the construction site and gain some cost efficiencies. The challenge is if we treat our construction workforce as a bunch of you know blue collar knuckleheads who who can't understand technology, now now you've got a conflict. So what we need is a is a modernized construction workforce where everyone understands like yeah I'm a construction worker, but I also know how to operate this AR model. And that is what's going to allow us to innovate in terms of infrastructure, in terms of clean energy and rebuild, you know, the parts of this country that need to be rebuilt. You know, I've been hearing about limitations to hiring as being a main challenge for growth for so many years now from disruptors. But it's interesting now that there are these new solutions. Um, Donnell, thank you so much for talking to us about your company. If you feel like it, stick around. We're going to bring you all together at the end. But thanks so much for talking. I'll be to here. Thank today. you. Thanks. So, John, what do you think? This is in your backyard here in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's it's good to see um, a uh, diversity in where these companies are coming from. I remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago, New York was sort of wringing its hands that there were no major tech IPOs even out of New York companies. And that's definitely turned around. I remember when, um, when Yahoo bought... Um, it's escaping. You know the company. Um, Taylor There's Swift so likes many, it. so many. Well, the, the one that was based in New York, uh, the Tumblr. Tumblr. Yahoo bought oh, Tumblr, Tumblr yes, which is yes. a New York company. It's like, oh, it could have gone public. It would have been New York. But now you got MongoDB. You got, you got so many uh, of these companies that have come out. So it's good to see block power coming out of the blocks. Um, so strong, the Disruptor 50, for multiple reasons. And then what he's saying about construction and AR, so much of the technology these days is bridging that gap between the physical and the digital. Whether you're talking about e-commerce, whether you're talking about social now and augmented reality, uh, or you're talking even about construction. So I, there's so much productivity possibility resting in that. Possibility and opportunity, I hope, with these new technologies. Let's bring in our third CEO guest, Mariam Rofagarin. And I believe Movandi is in Irvine, California. Is that right? That's correct. That's so correct. not too far from he, me here in Los, Los Angeles. Mariam, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. So talk to us about what Movandi does. You're at the cutting edge of 5G. How does your service, your, your system work? And, and explain it in layman terms. Okay. So uh, you can think of Movandi as the uh, Intel inside for 5G network. 
uh, that enables the widespread and deployment of 5G. So we have developed technology, uh, patented technologies that include all the way from components levels, chips, uh, software, specialized beam forming technology that are all needed for 5G to perform. And we are being deployed by various uh, uh, tier one uh, kind of service providers and operators, including Verizon, Korea Telecom uh, globally. Uh, we are a mature company, we're shipping products today. And uh, basically our technology is, uh, as I mentioned, inside the devices, it uh, works, it enables the 5G ecosystem. And uh, by deploying and using our technology, uh, you can reduce the deployment indoor and outdoor, the cost of deployment by almost 50%. And mm -hmm. uh, ex you accelerate the deployment of that by, five, by 50% as well. Uh, that's that's important because I, I think there's a little bit of 5G disappointment that's starting to happen out there for some people. You know, you see these reports about you, you see 5G on your phone, but it's actually slower than it was under LTE in some uh, instances. And people are, are learning the hard way that there are different flavors of 5G. You know, are you in an area that's got millimeter wave, for example? And that's a key part, millimeter wave, of what Movandi is able to enable and deliver, right? Right, so you know, as we mentioned, there are different flavors of 5G. There is the lower frequency, mid frequency, and the millimeter wave. And everything about 5G and all the applications and the promise of 5G about very low latency, being able to support you know, you know, tens of gigabits of throughput, et cetera, it all comes down with the high frequency where you actually have very big bandwidth, right? So you just mentioned that uh, the experience hasn't been good because so far everything has been in the, either in 5G millimeter wave with very low coverage and that's exactly what we're trying to address. Basically, uh, there is a challenge with 5G millimeter wave to penetrate inside the building or go around the building. And our patented BMXR technology that we have developed and uh, we have built, which uh, you know we actually have announced that with Verizon uh, and it's being deployed. You can use that technology to go around the building, make sure that the signal comes in. So just look at it this way, 5G millimeter wave especially, as a whole 5G, but 5G millimeter wave especially, it's just the start of a very new technology, something that has had very hard challenges to solve. And these are being addressed by us and you know, all companies are trying to help this deployment happen. And we're the front runner uh, by developing this technology. And we're hoping that as deployment is starting and this technology being new is being adopted, uh, we, we are gonna be the next stage of rapid growth of this technology in a couple of years. I think it's important when we talk about 5G to remind everyone that perhaps the most important use of 5G is not our cell phones, which we will all complain it's not going to be meaningfully different enough, but in the Internet of Things and things like autonomous cars. Tell mm -hmm. us how you see 5G potentially being a real leap there for that kind of technology. So if you look at the cars today and the very smart ones, uh, all these cars, are, everything is localized uh, and they're limited to sensors and you know where you can actually detect the cars around you and it can tell the stars, you know, if you're in Tesla, my Tesla start shifting as soon as it gets ne next to the car. But, but that's limited to those area locally, right? So you get all the data from all around you and then locally there are some analysis that you can do inside the car. What, autonomous cars in the future, they really have to be a lot smarter. They really have to be able to know what's going on in the inter, at the intersection, which is far from you, what's happening in the city, because uh, you want to make sure that these cars are very smart, right? They can know things around them, uh, the data can be used to, to uh, manage traffic, because these cars, you know, they're not like me and you that see something and they can quickly uh, react to it. So there has to be, you have to be able to collect this data that are local and not only do processing inside the car to manage it, but for autonomous car, real autonomous car, 
you really have to be able to communicate at the center where all this data from all different kind of cars come in. You do very quick analysis at instantly. You can actually send back data to to all these cars and manage the traffic and and uh, and help the safety and collision and and everything that comes with it. So and the only way to make that happen is if you have very low latency, meaning right. that you know. In instance you can send the data and bring it back uh, so that's where uh, where it actually benefits R really autonomous cars need something like 5g well mariam there's probably no way to say this delicately but movandi is exactly the kind of company that big chip and telecom players like to try to buy right i mean whether it's qualcomm or intel like i will be shocked if in a few months we don't either hear some rumor or some headline about somebody either trying to or successfully, uh, if you decide, buying Movandi. How do you feel about the importance of independence at this stage or, or where Movandi fits in the ecosystem? Because yes, pe people have built companies based on this kind of disruptive uh, technology into multi-billion dollar public giants. Um, is that important? What's important is the impact we have to the industry. And I can tell you, this is, this is not my first startup. This is my second startup, our first startup, uh, which was Innovin System, right after we came out of UCLA, which we pioneered the technology that got all this uh, combo device and connectivities in all cell phones, right? So we, we decided to sell that company after a year and a half, as soon as they had a prototype and something that, and you know, it made sense at that time. And we went to Broadcom, at Broadcom, we were able to set up the whole wireless business and grow the business to come from having no wireless to becoming $3 billion business in a few years later. So, you know, and it's really enjoyable. I, what we enjoy, my brother and I, and the other co-founders and, and the team that we have, it's to see how you can impact the industry and what makes sense at any point of time, whether you go on your own independently or you see an opportunity that you can actually make a huge impact with uh, creating something big with another company all that I mean I wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say it's just one way determined but I would love to take this company and make it big and, and be, make it independent let's put it this way John what does that sound like a no comment no it sounds like somebody <laughs> who's uh, whose mind is open to all the possibilities which is uh, which is what, what innovators so often uh, get, uh, manage to pull off. You know, I, I also wonder what you think of the environment for this kind of innovation in wireless going forward. As you mentioned, this isn't your first uh, startup, whether it's policy, whether it is um, the influence of large players already in the ecosystem. Is it a hospitable environment for a disruptive idea. Well, generally speaking, you know, there are it's there will be a lot of like, competitions. There will be, but again, we have established ourselves uh, as a front runner and leading position today, and and we believe that we can continue these leading positions. We have already engaged with the tier one. Uh, operators and service providers uh, all over the world globally, uh, from Verizon to Korea to Australia. And we've been able to actually help them to understand some of the challenges and work with them closely, engage with them, having you know technological discussions, etc. So, so I think we have put ourselves in a position that uh, it's made our company very strong and we, we can uh, work with our partners very closely to basically address all the challenges. And as I mentioned, our technology is unique, it's patented. Uh, there are not too many companies who can actually develop that VMXR and I think it's, it's all gonna work uh, well for us. So Miriam, I have a question that um, I, I wanna pose to you that we talked about with our last guest, which is, what is the biggest challenge to your growth? You have this unique technology. There's certainly demand for 5G, but what are the factors that are that are holding you back? Is it hard for you to hire the right kind of workforce? Are you impacted by the chip shortage? Well, uh, a couple of things, like just that applies to everybody. Uh, the very, I think one of the things is that again, 
uh, 5G and especially millimeter wave. And you know, that's why we're here, disruptive, right? This is a new technology, it's just the beginning. So, so it's not something that's very high volume today, but we are actually initiating it. So deployment time is a little bit longer than it should be, but, but in a couple of years, it's gonna be the inflection point when it actually is gonna become very, very fast to speed. So, uh, so we're working to make sure that we have everything ready for that ramp. Uh, uh, talent is definitely always a challenge and you know nowadays uh, but there are a lot of opportunities everywhere we've been very lucky with the people we have you know the talent the smart people that we have in the company uh, but again yeah that's always something that is not that easy to uh, to basically get uh, people uh, the chip shortage etc uh, that you mentioned uh, you know i believe again this is not going to be lasting forever it's something that uh, has made the semiconductor mainstream right now uh, we have worked very closely we have a very good partnership with our uh, you know partner uh, foundry and we've been working with them to make sure that we can address the demand uh, and make sure we uh, you know we can continue the work well, fascinating time for your industry, and I hope that we all get to experience the benefits of 5G, not just in our phones, but in all the connected devices around us. Maryam Rafugaran, thank you so much for talking to us, and congrats on being named to the CNBC Disruptor 50 list. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, John, I believe that we have another final guest here to bring in, John Sibley uh, Butler, who was um, uh, who is, is joining us now from the University of Texas Macomb School of Business, um, John, are you with us? I am with you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so curious to hear, hear your perspective because you are the chair for constructive capitalism. And we have been talking with some of our guests about having companies that have a social or environmental purpose built in to the business model. What does constructive capitalism mean in your definition? And the definition is that as we build companies, number one, you build in your workers so that we can replace the whole idea of just simple unionism such that when you go public, then your workers will also benefit. The other idea is that you connect the ecosystem with the absolute construction of the company. So constructive capitalism means that you have a plan, that it relates to your workers, and you also build your workers' future into your company. At the University of Texas at Austin, and in Austin, Texas, we wanted to build companies that really, really created wealth, not only for individuals involved in starting the company, but also for the workers themselves. So it's been a fantastic ride here in the great state of Texas and in the city of Austin, Texas, as we, we've become the model, if you will, for other people. The copy along with Silicon Valley and 128 in Boston. Sorry for that boast for Texas tradition. <laughs> Um, well, so I want to stay with us. I just want to bring on um, some of the other guests, including Ari Wallach, who, like you, is part of our Disruptor 50 Advisory Council, um, as well as Mariam and Donnell, who um, are CEOs of two of our Disruptor 50 companies. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting, John, is this idea that companies can perform better if they behave in this socially responsible way. Have you seen this correlation between performance and, and corporate behavior? And how would you sort of advocate that CEOs, especially the type of CEOs of, of companies on our list, these fast growing companies, think about that responsibility? Well, absolutely. As you know, here, here in, 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 in Texas, we had, we, had, we had a company that didn't do very, that was very, doing very well in Houston. And uh, all of a sudden it disappeared because they had great leadership. They thought they had great leadership and all of a sudden it didn't exist anymore. So you're absolutely right. What you have to do is, is follow the rules, look at what's going on because it's all about customer satisfaction. You're building your company, remember, for customer satisfaction and also to create jobs and to create wealth. So if you look at Enron, I don't mind uh, calling the name. Uh, it was a great company. They were doing everything, but they were not socially responsible. So if you look at all of the great companies that have existed, there's always been that relationship between social responsibility and taking care of the customer. If you look at what happened, for example, to the Sam's or, or what happened to Sears and Robot, I think that Sears took the eyes off of this responsibility to the customer. And if you look at what Walmart did, Sam Walton said, everything that we do, we gear toward the customer. So that relationship statistically has been there. And now as we move to this next, let's call it America 6.0, that it is very, very necessary in this connected world 
that we look at the relationship between social responsibility and absolutely doing well. Well, uh, Banu, I don't know. Like, I can think of a lot of companies that I've covered that uh, where leadership is very smart. They've got innovative ideas, but they're not particularly at the time socially responsible. Um, you know, I'll call out Apple. Uh, you know, d during part of its rise, Steve Jobs was not championing anything outside of design and product with a particular fervor. It's after Tim Cook took over that we saw the environmental push and a lot more diversity in their marketing and the people on stage at Apple events and kind of the investments in education, things like that. Um, so, I mean, it, it seems like being really irresponsible will sink you, but I wonder about the correlation. Well, if you look at, you know, right, that, uh, one was for, that one was for that uh, one was for for Banu. Yeah, oh. thank you, John. And I, I completely agree. So uh, some of my research actually is on corporate social responsibility and supply chains, particularly in Southeast Asian factories where the predominant labor force is young, female and underpaid and in precarious work environments. So um, absolutely, I think there is going to be a reckoning in terms of the new generation, the you know, Generation Y or Z or whatever letter that we're on, looking at the ways in which their value system is going to impact not only the investment thesis, but also the business strategies and practices of organizations, because it's easy to check a box and say we're socially responsible, but it's really, really hard, I think, to make sure that there is value alignment in all parts of the organization, the workplace, the marketplace, and the community. And I think a lot of organizations have gotten away because we don't always tend to think of employees uh, that are far off in the distance. But in reality, I think we're recognizing that they're part of the community and the workplace and the marketplace. And that is all um, intersecting right now. Yes, and let's also add, as they develop, certainly they would change through time. So, you know, the old term is, is, is corporate responsibility. That is uh, giving to 501Cs, uh, doing a Dell Medica a Center and those kind of things. So, you know, whatever your operational definition is, then those things have changed. But what has not changed is that the relationship between doing stuff for community, uh, doing stuff for, for the country and creating great products, whether it was General Motors uh, that took the lead during World War II or whatever the situation uh, might have been. Uh, Ari, I want to ask you to respond here. As someone who's thinking about the long, long term, 50, 100 years in the future, do you think that there is a sea shift uh, away from what John was talking about? Do you think this generation right now understands there needs to be a different weight uh, and value put on that kind of social and environmental responsibility? So I, I, definitely. And, but it's interesting when you say this generation, look, we, we work at, at Long Path Labs, we work with really young folk but also folk in their 60s and 70s it, who are starting to actually rethink this, this idea that we move from, from a shareholder capitalism to a stakeholder capitalism. And now they're expanding out what that stakeholder is. So it not only is your employees and your staff and your community, but very much so they're thinking about future generations as stakeholders, right? So in what you're doing and what you're putting out there in the world, how are you being a, a great ancestor to future generations? We often think of ourselves at the end of history, we're really just at the beginning. We're, we're not at the end of, of this human project. We're really at the beginning. We have, I think, 10, 20,000 years to go. So therefore, we're seeing companies and leaders from, from their 20s to their 80s think about how do they think about the, the stakeholders that aren't even born yet and actually taking them into account in what they do and what they put out in the world. And we're seeing those companies raising money and doing really, really well. Yeah, fascinating. I want to ask Donnell and Mariam to both give a final thought here before we have to wrap things up. Donnell, so much of what you're doing is convincing companies the financial opportunity and doing the right thing for the environment. What do you think your biggest challenge is other than getting the right workers in place in, in making this really a meaningful shift in the way everyone thinks about the power in, in their homes and in office buildings in the, in the coming decade to, to push it further out than just the next couple of years? No, thanks for the question. I think that I think that valuing carbon and carbon reduction and carbon emissions is going to be among the most important challenges that we face. How do we use blockchain and cryptocurrency to properly quantify uh, avoided carbon emissions? And how do we resell that to other buyers? 
um, and create like a, a kind of low carbon or a carbon avoidance economy that's investment grade and that's communal and that's based on cryptocurrency. That's one of the big challenges that we face. And Mariam, uh, your final thought, and if it's got to do with uh, how we enable creative disruption uh, in this economy and in this country, all the better. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's one of the things that is important to me, a few things, right? It's uh, definitely, I mean, look at it after this COVID, for example, uh, a lot of students were at home, right? Uh, and there were many who didn't even have access to to uh, join their classes because they didn't have access to the technology. And as far as I'm concerned, I that's one of the things that I would love to see that both governments and you know technology companies like us, uh, that's one of the goals. We're, we're hoping that what we're developing is affordable enough and it can provide access to everyone, basically provide access to whether you're poor or you're you know rich wherever you are you can get access so that you can at least join your classes and so that's that's very important to me and i'm hoping we can do that uh, with the help of government and and generally uh, happening and that importance of accessibility only highlighted in the past year or so of the pandemic we are out of time i want to thank you all so much for joining us this is a fascinating conversation John Butler, Ari Wallach, Banu Ozkazang, Pan, Howie Liu, Donnell Baird, and Mariam Rufugaran. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you'll all go to cnbc.com slash disruptors and check out the whole list and more of our coverage. John Ford, always a pleasure to play ball with you. And I will see you on Tech Tech tomorrow. That's right.